All right. Well, welcome everyone. I am Dr. Josh. This is Digital Hammurabi, and uh, Megan has started the stream because it would never happen otherwise, and because this is I'm just not good at this stuff. But I know how to find the real experts. You see, and that's why Dr. Durell is here, um, and he's he's going to probably hate me for um, saying so many kind things about him, but. <laughs> Hopefully that's not too embarrassing for you. Um, so I'm Dr. Josh Bowen. Uh, we run Digital Hammurabi, Megan and I. Uh, hopefully the audio is working. Um, if somebody wants to just let me know in the side chat if the audio is working okay. Dr. Durell, if you want to say hi, just uh, make sure everybody can hear you. Hi, everyone. Awesome. It looks like it's working okay. Uh, so uh, today we are going to be talking about a topic that might be a little uncomfortable for people and I expect that you writing about it was probably a little uncomfortable uh, and but you know it's something that's I think very very important to understand about the biblical texts about the ancient Near East in general and really our our broader understanding of the Hebrew Bible because Israelite religion is is not so straightforward and as Dr. Durell I'm, I'm sure will tell you it's not an easy thing to study, and it's not an easy thing to, to wrestle with because there are very uh, complicated issues uh, with respect to the composition of the text, the texts, um, and the, the, the dating of these things, uh, of these books, and certain passages, and editorial redactions, the whole thing. It's very, very complicated. And then trying to, amidst all of that, um, difficulty to try to then extract historical reality um, and to try to tie it to to pull it from um, what might be considered propagandistic language and ulterior motives those sorts of things but anyway Dr. Durrell I'm sure we'll talk about that um, as much as he feels comfortable and I just really appreciate you being on the show today I think it's gonna be I think it's gonna be fantastic um, so before we get started, I just wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of things that are coming up on the channel, uh, or on w w maybe we're going to be going onto a different channel. Um, Megan, I, I just remembered, Megan is putting together, I hope it's okay that I say this, uh, she has had some comments recently about, is it okay that I talk about the, your video that's coming up? Yeah, I'm just going to turn the audio down a little, it's a bit high. Oh, okay. She's going to turn the audio down. Okay. Thank you. Um, she has had some comments recently on uh, breastfeeding. Um, this is one of the challenges of being a new mother uh, or a mother of a, a newborn. Our, our, our uh, little boy is almost 11 months old and he eats. That's what babies do. And so when you're live streaming, it can be very difficult to, particularly when you're by yourself, it can be very difficult to um, find an hour and a half block to do a live stream without your child waking up and being hungry. And so oftentimes she will come in and very casually breastfeed him. Well, we had, we've had many comments, many, not many, probably three or four significant comments. And she's a little frustrated with them. So she is putting together breastfeeding in the ancient world. And I think it's actually just going to be a fascinating video. And... Um, yeah, stay tuned for that. That's going to be really interesting. We're uh, we're collaborating with some other seriologists. I think it's going to be really cool. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I will be on Aaron Ra's channel in the near term. I was emailing with him yesterday. Uh, fantastic guy. If you if you didn't see my um, former stream or the other stream that I did with him, uh, where we talked about um, Ezekiel twenty six and some other uh, passages in the Old Testament, I think it's I think it's worth watching. Obviously, uh, we will be together on Mr. Atheist channel talking about science in the ancient Near East and, you know, does the Bible have um, um, innovative, um, original, scientific things that makes it thus divinely inspired or is it part of a, a continuum, a scientific continuum from the ancient world? Uh, that's something we'll talk about. And then finally, and I'll stop talking about this, uh, we will be on Paula Gia's channel. And sorry, Dr. Durell, I don't know if you probably don't know anything about anything I'm talking about uh, uh, as far as the channels are concerned. But uh, he, we're going to be on his ham and eggs review of um, Answers in Genesis. So it should, be, it should be a lot of fun. You will get to see Megan as a cartoon. Uh, you guys have seen me as a cartoon on his channel, but now you'll get to see Megan. So 
Also, Megan wanted me to tell you that I am sporting our new digital Hammurabi. I can't call it merch. I absolutely refuse to call it merch. Everybody calls it merch. I, I'm calling it Chandice. That's what I'm doing. So I'm sporting our new digital Hammurabi Chandice. <laughs> Megan uh, uh, has put this stuff together. So anyway, really fantastic. Okay, all that introductory stuff out of the way. Thank you for your patience, Dr. Duro. Let me introduce our amazing guest. He taught me Acadian my first year when I was at Johns Hopkins University, and he's just a heck of a guy and a brilliant scholar, and I'm just so honored to have him on here. So I have decided I'm just going to read, oh, as I hit my microphone, I am just going to read um, his profile to you because I think it's really important to hear what he's about. So Heath, du uh, Heath Durrell is Assistant Professor of Old Testament at Princeton Theological Seminary. That's right, everybody. Princeton. He earned his Master's of Arts in Religion from Yale. He's a serious scholar, folks. You just, sorry, I'm not, I, I don't get uh, I don't get the, the the low guys on here. We get the best of the best. Um, and earned his PhD from Johns Hopkins University, which of course I have a slight preference for. <laughs> his primary interests are in the ancient uh, are the ancient Near Eastern context of the Old Testament, the history of Israelite religion. Uh, especially the diversity of religious practice and belief in ancient Israel and Hebrew and other uh, Semitic languages. His first book, which we will be talking about today, which you can see on the screen, Child Sacrifice in the Ancient Near East, uh, on the topic of Child Sacrifice in the ancient, Near in ancient Israel, sorry, I said Ancient Near East, I always do that, uh, was published in 2017. It's an amazing book. I highly recommend that you read it. We're going to talk about it today, obviously. The link is in the description. Snap it up. Guys, it's worth the read. really, really is. Um, he is currently working on a second book, examining the historical context of the book of Hosea. And he is an active member of the Episcopal Church. Sorry. Uh, she's adjusting the audio a little bit. Apparently I have a really annoying voice and she's trying to fade that out somehow. So, welcome, Dr. Durrell. Uh, it's just really great to have you here. Thanks. Great to be here. I thought that maybe we could start off... Um, just kind of getting a little bit of a background on you. Um, and by the way, if you have questions, please text, I mean, text them, put them in the side chat. If there's something that's pressing, Megan will text them to me and um, and we'll, we'll go through them. Is that is that okay with you, Dr. Durrell? We Cool. That's great. Very good. Very good. Um, so would you mind giving us a little bit of background on your education and career? What got you interested in studying the Hebrew Bible? Um, and you mentioned other Semitic languages that you know. What other ancient Near Eastern languages do you have training in? Um, so uh, my uh, relationship with the Bible in general and the Hebrew Bible in particular, uh, it goes back as far as I can remember. Um, my first allowance, actually, I believe I was four, maybe five years old. I would get a quarter per verse of Psalms that I memorized. So the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. King James Version, of course. Uh, and, and then I'd get my quarter. And then I, next verse, then another quarter. Um, the uh, Yeah, I, uh, I grew up in the Assemblies of God, which is a uh, fairly conservative, Pentecostal, evangelical Christian denomination. I, uh, uh, I went to Christian, mostly Christian Baptist, and then uh, charismatic Pentecostal uh, elementary schools. We had Bible class every day at school. I was in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, sometimes more than that when I, once I got into to be a teenager. Uh, yeah, so by the time I was 18 and ready to go to college, uh, I was going to be a, a pastor, first a youth pastor because that's the route you did these things in. Uh, I went off to Oral Roberts University, which was the only school that I applied to um, and uh, thankfully got in. Uh, when I got there, I was uh, a pastoral care and counseling major, I think was the name of the, the major that was, um, and my first month or so of, uh, at Oral Roberts, we had advisement, and I sat down with the freshman advisor for all theology majors, which is what I was, and he advised that uh, a good pastor would need more grounding in scripture, in theology, in history, in business, frankly, than four years of undergraduate education would be, would uh, supply. Um, and he recommended to all theology majors 
that you switch over to either Old Testament or New Testament, which were two majors that were available at Oral Roberts, um, and then minor in something like business, something practical for running the church, and then go on to divinity school afterward to kind of round out the rest of your education. Uh, I had no interest in business whatsoever, uh, but I did take his advice to heart, and I switched to a uh, New Testament major, uh, Old Testament minor, uh, the, uh, which was great. Lots of Greek, lots of Hebrew, lots, um, uh, not too many places I think that you can major in New Testament and minor in Old. Um, uh, along the way, like a lot of folks do when they're in college, uh, started questioning everything, uh, you know, the, everything from uh, you know, the way the way your parents raised you to if you're raised a Democrat, maybe you explore being a Republican, or if you're born a Republican, explore being a Democrat. And uh, so every question everything. And uh, I came, uh, there were some aspects of the tradition that I was brought up with, brought it in that I started to find problematic, um, especially some of the things I saw at Oral Roberts that I saw problematic. Um, I won't go into them too much, but like uh, the prosperity gospel, the idea that if you give money to the evangel evangelist, God will give you stuff back. And seeing uh, not so well off people cashing their pension checks and giving them to the evangelists and then being even worse off. So you can imagine for a 19 year old that causes a, a faith crisis, which is essentially what I had. Uh, for a while, I wasn't anything, but I stayed passionate about the Bible. But uh, if I'm not going to be a preacher and I've got a Bible degree and a Bible minor, <laughs> Uh, and I still love the Bible, even though I'm not sure what to do with it. What, what do I do? So uh, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll eventually just get a PhD in Bible and I can teach it like my professors at Oral Roberts did. So that's what sent me off to Yale Divinity School. Uh, there, the first, I think I showed up, I think my application said I still wanted to do, to do New Testament. Um, and I still don't know why, but over the summer, I decided I found the Old Testament more interesting, uh, the Hebrew Bible more interesting. Uh, my first week at Yale, I switched over into Hebrew Bible Old Testament. Um, I was especially interested in Second Temple Judaism. John Collins was there, still is there. Um, uh, one of the authorities on the Dead Sea Scrolls. I got really interested in that. So, uh, yeah, so I did my degree there. My last year at Yale, I took an Israelite religion class with Bob Wilson. And almost in passing, he said something about, well, um, something about child sacrifice in ancient Israel in this Israelite religion class. And they kept going. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. People believe that was actually happening? And he said, well, if they weren't, then Jeremiah and Ezekiel sure seem to think they were. So that fascinated me. And I was already applying for PhD programs, but from that moment in that class, I knew that that was the question I wanted to pursue. So I was one of the rare, probably annoying students that showed up to Hopkins with a dissertation topic already. In, and I, in high, now I know faculty kind of hate that. Like they want somebody that's going to show up and want to work on what you know the faculty member wants them to work on. Um, but the reason I went to Hopkins was because, uh, because Ted Lewis was there. Ted Lewis has done a ton with Israelite religion. Um, he certainly had a strong enough background in child sacrifice in particular to supervise that dissertation. Um, so I don't think I was as, as annoying as I could have been. Uh, along the way, moving from um, Oral Roberts to Yale to Hopkins, um, while I was kind of nothing religiously for a while, um, I started to see that lots of people um, were good, devout Christians and didn't believe all of the things about the Bible what the Bible is um, at a foundational level that I was taught you had to believe about the Bible in order to be a good Christian. Um, everyone in New Haven is an Episcopalian. That's a slight exaggeration, but uh, it's a very, very Episcopal town. Um, and I started attending the Episcopal church with some friends and it fit for me. And I just kind of, kind of hung around. Um, after Hopkins, um, I was a year after my dissertation, after defending my dissertation on the job market, thankfully I landed uh, here at Princeton Seminary, which is a great fit, I think, because it's both got a lot of folks that are very passionate about the Bible for reasons of faith, um, but it's also got lots of folks who are very committed to academic rigor, who are interested in asking the tough questions, 
who are interested in learning the dead languages. Uh, that's a lot of what I do here. Um, I do teach Acadian. I've actually got an independent study I'm running this January on Acadian again. Um, I teach Aramaic regu regularly. Um, I took Middle Egyptian at Hopkins, but they haven't given me the opportunity to teach that here yet. I'm, I'll keep pushing. Uh, I have taught Ugaritic. Uh, Mark Smith is here now, though. And since he joined the faculty, I don't get to teach Ugaritic as much as. Uh, yeah, that's probably enough of me yammering on. No, I mean, it's it's. It's fantastic to hear these things because I think there are probably a lot of people in the audience that are listening uh, and people that will watch this, um, you know, later on that are going to, they, they always, one of the things that I hear over and over and over and over again, uh, when people hear that I was an evangelical Christian for 30 years, uh, fundamentalist, you and I have very similar stories. I went to Liberty University uh, mm -hmm. and then Capital Bible Seminary. Uh, you know, my my uh, thesis on El Shaddai, uh, the, one of the opening paragraphs was the pre there's a presupposition of this thesis that Moses wrote all five books of the Pentateuch, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe not the sentence about his death, but, you know, but he right, wrote right. everything else. And, you know, walking, walking away from that, um, and yet, you know, Megan, my wife, is, is Episcopalian, she's Anglican, um, you know, as a, as a religious person, she would identify as a Christian, um, and I would identify as an agnostic. But maybe this leads to, uh, so sorry, so what I hear over and over again is, well, <laughs> First John tells us that if you went out from us, you were not really one of us, right? Mm -hmm. So you obviously didn't believe the biblical title. You didn't believe the um, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You didn't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, salvation by grace through faith. You didn't understand it or you didn't really believe it because there's no way that you could actually leave fundamental evangelical Christianity um, and having actually believed and understood it. And I, I think that's just a very unsophisticated approach. Um, but I understand it, right? Because if you, I mean, you remember this, I'm sure, if, if somebody, you had confronted somebody like yourself now uh, mm -hmm. or like me now, Back then, you would have said, I would, I would have said anyway, exactly the same thing, uh, because that's the only way that I can keep these seemingly two um, uh, mutually exclusive things uh, together. So, so let me ask you that um, before we actually get into the book, because I, 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 I am really excited about about doing that. Now, I, I, I might ask you to come back on to just have a conversation about your, your faith experience um, in, in more detail, because I think that would be actually really fascinating to talk about. Um, but we're here for child sacrifice. That sounded really, really bad. Um, <laughs> but could you talk just a little bit about how you reconcile things like historical inaccuracies in the Hebrew Bible and still maintain your faith? Like, what what does that look like? Um, how, how does that happen? Yeah. Um uh, in a lot of ways, uh, I think um, uh, Jewish believers have a bit of an easier time uh, in that if you read uh, the rabbis, they're equivalent to their church fathers, right? Um, and you read the descriptions of the discussions and the debates they have, the descriptions go something like Rabbi Shammai says this and Rabbi Hillel says that. And then that's it. Like, it doesn't say, and this one's right all the time. You know, sometimes it puts thumb on the scale. Um, for me, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, reads a lot like that. We have lots of voices um, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and if you read them closely, one person says this on a topic, and another author, scribe, text, whatever you want to say, uh, says that. And... There's not always at the end of the day, and this, uh, this is the right one of the two. Um, I think it's important to recognize that um, all texts are written with um, aims and goals. Often those aims and goals um, might be undermined by the, own, the, the text themselves. I mean, the authorial intent doesn't tell us everything about a text, but every text, at least in the Bible, I think had some kind of intention for being written down. Um, I think almost never was that intention merely to preserve history. Um, 
that is a lot of times they cite their source material and that source material sounds like it was a lot more interested in that. That the, if you're more interested in this, look at the, the, the Chronicles of the Days of the Kings of Judah and Israel. Or, or, um, so yeah, I get interested in the places where there's tension in the text, where you have, because they do seem to have a common groundwork or framework. For example, in the book, there does seem to be a common assumption throughout, as far as I can tell, the entire Hebrew Bible, um, that in some way, firstborn children belong to the Lord, Yahweh, the God of Israel. Um, that gets played out in three, four, maybe five different ways. Um, um, but they've got this common groundwork. One person, one text mate might say that um, you're to give some kind of animal sacrifice in lieu of the firstborn child. Another might say you're supposed to pay um, X amount to support the shrine. Uh, another text actually uh, counts off the number of firstborn children that were wandering in the wilderness, allegedly, and then counts up the Levites and says there's one for one, and when the numbers don't quite match, then they have to find a way. But the Levites take the place of the firstborn children. Um, in one text, I would argue that it just says that you're to give God your firstborn child. Um, so there's diversity of belief represented in the Hebrew Bible, but there's also a strong commonality, which is no surprise. It's, it's you know, one large society with groups within it. Uh, so when I read the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, uh, I view it as the conversation, the, far, the furthest back I can trace the conversation um, that I hope I'm still participating in. That they're having this conversation back here. Um, these folks that I think some of them would have vehemently disagreed with each other. I think, uh, for example, uh, Deuteronomy um, and the so called holiness material. There's some pretty harsh disagreements about fundamental issues. Um, but then they get tacked together, and whoever was gathering the whoever whoever's were gathering these texts together said we need to hear both. Um, I think that general attitude toward matters of religion um, and faith uh, breeds humility. That maybe my voice isn't the only voice. Maybe uh, maybe uh, the Pentecostals and Southern Baptists that raised me got some stuff right that now I'm I should be listening better, and maybe vice versa. Um, so yeah, I think treating scripture as a conversation rather than as a catechism, um, allows me, um, uh, to be okay with saying, okay, well, this voice I can hear, uh, there, there are many voices in the Bible that, uh, really resonate with me. Uh, and it's funny because some that resonate with me now, uh, may not have resonated with me as much when I was a teenager. Uh, when I was a teenager, I read Ecclesiastes. I swear it had to be at least four or five dozen times between the time I was 15 and the time I was 17. Because Ecclesiastes, which I was, and, and now it's, uh, yeah, maybe that's not, maybe that's not where, where I, where I am anymore. I'm less angsty than I was then. But, uh, but then I find new texts. Like now I found the Psalms to be horribly just boring as a teenager and now those voices really speak to me um, in a way that they didn't before. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't really, if someone says, well, Ezekiel said X, Y, and Z was going to happen, and it didn't happen exactly that way. Uh, so. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, um, I think there are two things. Uh, and, and Megan has texted me to tell me that, uh, that I need to tell everybody that's watching, and I think how many are watching now? Something like close to 70. Mm -hmm. You are very popular, Dr. Durell, so this is fantastic, thank you. But I'm supposed to say hit the like button, and uh, if you like it thus far, get, believe me, it's gonna get better. So uh, tweet tweet it out, or Facebook it out, or whatever it is that you know someone might do to spread, to spread the good news that this is happening. Um, but no, I, I think that engaging with the tension and and being okay with the tension and saying one of the things that I think about when I think about a movement that you might not think is so popular, but it is, 
uh, is something like a King James only movement. And I don't know how much you have exposure to that, but there's a fair amount of it on YouTube. And, you know, you, you think when you hear someone say, I don't believe that the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts are the ones that are inspired, which, of course, I would be fine with. But 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 if I'm an evangelical, obviously, that's not that's not OK. Um, but that the King James Bible in 1611 is the one that's inspired. And you think, why? Where, where does this come from? And I think for many people, it has its root at there's finality, mm -hmm. right? We can go to this source. And it doesn't matter if the text was redacted before. It doesn't matter if there are all these different manuscripts that we have to compare. This King James Bible, this is the word of God. All that stuff gets simplified down. Now we're just dealing with the English text and trying to reconcile that as opposed to all these different issues. For, for example, I don't know if you've read uh, Dr. Dershowitz's article on Leviticus 18, uh, where he talks about um, homosexuality and mm -hmm. um, you know the redaction uh, uh, during the Persian period. of the, It's a fascinating article. Uh, I tried to summarize it sort of in an understandable way uh, on our channel. But just whether he's right or wrong, just engaging at that level is extraordinarily complex. Um, and I just think people want to not bang their head up against the wall, right? And they, don't, they, they want to go to sleep at night knowing the right answer. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, when you, when you have to be in that position, you lose, I think, some of the joy, frankly, uh, in the struggle um, and trying to, trying to wrestle with this. Well, that sort of leads me into our transitional question mm -hmm. that I have. Uh, because you're going to be dealing with in child sacrifice in, in in Israel, ancient Israel, you're going to be dealing with in your book and talk, or you, you you did deal with passages from different books that mm -hmm. uh, are part of this tapestry, if we can call mm -hmm. it that, of complexity in authorship and composition. You know, is the Deuteronomistic school a couple of people, a whole bunch of people, one person? You know, I guess it wouldn't be a school if it's one person, but. Um, and so in light of that complexity, um, could you give us some general background on the nature of the Hebrew Bible and its composition, please? Again, I, I said this before the stream, but this is not a comprehensive examination question. Uh, you don't have to feel, uh, like people are, people are going to be holding a magnifying glass up to everything that you say. Cause I didn't uh, just, as so everybody knows, I didn't ask him to prep any of this. I sprung it on him at the last second. I'm really sorry. Um, it sounded so hollow. I meant it, though. Um, but could you talk about the Hebrew Bible and its composition, things like dates, settings, and maybe even historical reliability? Um, and just so you know, I mute because I don't want to make, I don't want to hear any, um, I don't want there to be any feedback, and I want everybody to focus on you. So when you talk, I try to mute. So anyway. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it was... Uh... Different books of the Hebrew Bible are written at different times. Um, I would say that, I don't know, the books in the form that we have them, or something close to it, we're probably talking, uh, I don't know, 800s through the second century. Um, but that said, we also seem to have some old stuff hanging around in there. Um, uh, the poem in Judges 5, is in an older type of Hebrew, but when did it get written down? When was it sung versus when it, so this, this interface between orality and textuality, um, and we can't know unless we have time machines and tape recorders, we can't go back and talk about the pre-textual forms. Um, even once they are written down, then they're collected together. Collections are collected into larger collections. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the so-called uh, Book of the Twelve, uh, the Minor Prophets, you might know them better as. Um, when those were collected together, did they just sit them down side by side or did someone come in and try to make it into some kind of coherent whole? Um, the, uh, so yeah, I mean, like, so the Pentateuch, I don't come down strongly, whether you have four sources that run throughout, like say, uh, Baruch Schwartz and Joel Baden would argue, um, or whether you've got the supplementary building up of stuff, um, like a, lots of folks on the continent, like Conrad Schmidt and um, David Carr here in New York. 
Um, so I don't have strong opinions about exactly how it came together, but to me it does look like a gradual thing, and I would say a collection of collections of collections. That stuff, uh, someone thought this stuff was important, um, and someone thought it was important to collect it together. Um, some folks, as they collected, uh, expanded, and, uh, and uh, uh, I think Isaiah is a good example of this. You get a collection of oracles, but even within that collection, there are clear indications that someone else has come along and, and uh, explained, interpreted, maybe, what's going on there. Uh, and then you get uh, more added on to the end, and more added on to the end. Uh, uh, when it comes to historical reliability, it's always a case-by-case -case basis for me. Uh, I think every text tells us uh, primarily about the time of the people doing the writing. Um, secondarily, it tells us about what the people doing the writing believed about the period in which they were writing, or at least what they want people to believe. Uh, and, uh, and then third, it tells us maybe something about the period that they're describing. When, the, when they're all three close together, when it looks like, say, a prophet is writing about contemporary circumstances, then it's much easier for me to try to draw out historical information. Um, when there's centuries separating the period described and the period during which people are doing the writing down, even if there's some kind of oral tradition between the two, it's just messier. Um, so. That uh, that messiness, I think, is um, one of the things that I find allows us to have more uh, more videos that we could put together here. Um, I'm putting together, for example, uh, I just put together a script, a presentation on the Book of Daniel, and you know, obviously, everybody listening, uh, feel free to know this. Um, you know, I'm not. Very few people are an expert. Uh, have an expertise in the book of Daniel and being the Aramaic or the, the biblical Hebrew, the linguistics behind it, dating the linguistics. Is this, you know, um, imperial Aramaic or what should we date it to the fourth century? Should we date it to the more closer to the second century? It's very, very complicated. Um, as you obviously, Dr. Durell, well know. Um, but I, I think that looking at something like that uh, and trying to determine is there is there a difference between what's written um, concerning sixth century, uh, late seventh, early sixth century um, historical uh, events in the book of Daniel, as opposed to something in Ezekiel 26 and 29, where he doesn't seem to redact uh, this historical problem. And, you know, people like Greenberg and Block would say, I, I, I think Block would say this, that this is evidence um, at least some evidence that there's more reliability to what Ezekiel is saying here because there's not this later redaction of what's being said. However, with something like Daniel, um, mm -hmm. when you when you look at the historical uh, things that are stated, the historical events that are described early on, even though there are sometimes small, seemingly small differences uh, or inaccuracies, sometimes they're big. Uh, the order of uh, rulers or whose son is whose, um, there seems to be less precision early on when things are supposed to be, uh, you know, really well understood because that's the period that it's supposed to be written in traditionally. And yet when you get to the second century and these very specific events of chapter 11, there's seemingly very great precision. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we have to look at this. If you take if you take a necessarily supernatural, um, a supernatural authorship out of that, uh, from 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 the, that fundamentalist evangelical perspective that I would have had at Liberty University, if you take that out as a requirement, then you can look at your model and say what what makes more sense, right? And again, even at the end of the day, if we all agree that Daniel's written in the second century, right? It's not prophesying about Rome. Um, it's, 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 and it's ending with Antiochus IV. Um, even if we agree on that, uh, that doesn't mean that Christianity then falls apart, right? Mm -hmm. I think as, as you've said very well here, um, there are ways to hold that, that sort of thing in tension and to understand it 
just from a from a different perspective with a different model in mind and so awesome um this is this is really going well i think uh i'm, I'm really enjoying this and i think the audience probably is too um so let's get into your book because i've 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 taxed you enough on all this preliminary stuff and i really appreciate you being willing to sort of flow with me here so uh we have, and, and I'm going to ask questions, but if you want to go a completely different direction, you have a way you want to do this, you just go right ahead. I will, I will step aside. <laughs> um, so we have all heard of Molech, the horrible deity to whom babies were sacrificed, right? I hear about this actually an awful lot uh, when I discuss um, just Old Testament issues in general. Everybody talks about, you know, the, the great statue that was heated up and babies were, you know, uh, melting on it and and the drums were played loudly and all this stuff okay um was this the historical reality in your opinion and um and uh, where does this idea come from yeah so um the idea of a god named molech um without going too much into hebrew grammar um comes from the way uh, the hebrew preposition la um which means two or four. It can mean a lot of things, just like prepositions in English um, can mean a lot of things. Um, I go to the store with my wife. Uh, I hit the nail with a hammer. Those are two very different widths. Right? Um, so la, Hebrew la, can do a lot of things. One of the things it can do is mean two. So it says, uh, talks about in the Bible, passing over a child, sometimes in fire, la, molech. Um, which historically people have understood as to Molech, and Molech must be some being to which children are passed over by fire, which must be sacrificed to a deity, which is a perfectly reasonable way to understand the Hebrew. Um, almost a century ago now, uh, a German biblical scholar named Otto Eisfeld, who's actually still worth reading, he's a really smart guy, um, he wrote a little tiny book, under 100 pages, I believe. Um, the German title could be roughly translated uh, uh, Molk in Phoenician and in the Hebrew Bible, the, the end of the god Molech. And at this time, there were excavations going on in the North African Punic. And Punic just means Phoenicians that don't live in Phoenicia. They went out into the Mediterranean, they set up colonies, and then all of a sudden they became Punic because of Greek and Latin and uh, Anyway, they're excavating Carthage where these Punic colonists are living, uh, and they're finding inscriptions. And the inscriptions seem to be talking about child sacrifice. And, it's and they call the sacrifice a mulk. It's a mulk sacrifice. It's the name of a sacrifice. Um, and at the time, Eisfeld only had a handful of these inscriptions. Since then, we have quite a few more. Um, and Eisfeld said, wait a second, mulk child sacrifice. In the Hebrew Bible, we also have mulk. Another one of the things the preposition la in Hebrew can do is uh, to mean as. So if you sacrifice a cow, you can sacrifice it la o la, as a burnt offering, a whole offering, holocaust. Uh. And he said, we shouldn't be reading this, that children are, pass are passed over by fire uh, la to a god molech, but la as a Molech sacrifice. He went further and said, well, if they're sacrificing them as Molech sacrifices, then, okay, who's the God that's getting them? Um, and Eisfeld said, well, as far as we can tell, by far the most popular deity in ancient Israel was Yahweh. These sacrifices are said to have taken place in the Hinnom Valley, which would have been in not quite spitting distance, but it definitely, definitely eye shot of the Jerusalem temple. Um, uh, where Yahweh's shrine was. So Eisfeld said, no, no, they're not sacrificed to a god, Molech, but they were being sacrificed as Molech offerings to Yahweh. To be clear, the Hebrew Bible makes abundantly clear, um, maybe with minor exceptions, but even then it's controversial. These are not good. It never says that in the Hebrew Bible that you ought to be making these offerings to Yahweh. But it does say uh, several different times that you're not supposed to. And you never 
make you don't make laws against things that people aren't doing, and you don't say you should stop doing something if people aren't doing it. Um, uh, so yeah, so I felt suggestion, like I said, almost hundred years ago, was that these were um, sacrifices by some Yahwehs, not all, obviously, because the Hebrew Bible presents a different voice. Uh, but they thought that that Yahweh wanted them. Since then, the debate has gone back and forth between people saying, yes, yes, I felt 100% right. Uh, Paul Mosca in the 70s wrote a Harvard dissertation, which is brilliant, and I think right on just about everything. Uh, but then in the 80s, um, uh, a fellow named Hyder, another fellow named Day, John Day, many folks in the audience might know, wrote, say, no, 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 I felt was wrong. There is a God, Molech, at least in Israel. Um, but this is more or less where the debate is done. Yes, 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 no, no, yes, yes, no, no. Um, I tried to move a little, a bit beyond the debate. Instead of just saying, yes, they were, and it was to Yahweh, or no, it wasn't, and or, or yes, they were, but they were to Molech, uh, to start trying to pull the threads a bit further to see what we could say. Um, there's been some assumption in previous literature that if they were sacrifices to Yahweh, then they must have been a very ancient part of the Yahwistic cult that the Israelites just inherited when they came into the land of Canaan. And as far back as there were Israelites, there would have been these Molech offerings. On the other hand, if it's to a foreign god, foreign god Molech, then it's probably a late innovation. Um, the uh, uh, And... Uh, and these, the idea that if they're sacrificed to Yahweh, they must be old, and if they're sacrificed to Molech, they must be new, to me that didn't naturally follow. So one of the things I hope that uh, that I convince at least one or two people of is that you can have innovations in the Yahwistic cult um, late, and they can be forward influenced. And I think the Molech offerings are, are an example of that. Um, I think that uh, there's good evidence in the Punic colonies that these are old Phoenician rites. Uh, thanks to the way Lebanon and Syria and so on have been uh, settled since then, we don't have good excavations to tell us exactly what's going on in the Phoenician homeland, but that's a nice missing link. Um, so I suggest that probably during the reign of Ahaz or Ahaz, depending on how you pronounce it, um, he saw his Phoenician neighbors that had these... Molech sacrifices that probably had something to do with vows. Um, he decided to imitate his northern, um, probably more prestigious neighbors. Uh, there's other evidence that Ahaz or Ahaz was interested in uh, imitating his neighbors and brought these sacrifices into the Jerusalem cult um, and probably thought he was being a good Yahweh doing it. No one, no one says, oh, I'm going to be evil and reprobate and defile the cult of Yahweh. They you do what you think Yahweh wants. Um, obviously, the authors of the Hebrew Bible didn't agree. So yeah, this, all that to say, I think Molech was a type of offering, not a deity. I think that they were offered probably during the reigns of Ahaz, Ahaz, and Manasseh. Um, not a lot of information about whether they continued to be offered between the two, especially during the reign of good King Hezekiah. Uh, to me, I trust the biblical testimony on the, that it looks like Josiah got rid of them. Um, but there was some memory that for a century or so, um, these types of offerings took place just down the hill, literally, from the Jerusalem temple um, and were part of the Yahwistic cult. Um, yeah. Wow. Uh, I'm, I've got the live chat up here, and I, I, I'm not watching it because... <clears throat> I have MS, and if I watch it, my brain will just like shut down. I, I won't be able to follow both things. Um, but I have noticed it seems like there's some surprise uh, at this information uh, that uh, that that at least there's a a strong argument for um, child sacrifice, um, you know, taking place for Yahweh to Yahweh, and uh, yeah, that's. It's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on here because I think uh, I think actually everybody I mean uh, in, in my opinion Dr. Duhurel makes a very strong case for it and if you don't think he's right buy the book in fact several people I have I've learned already several people have purchased the book Megan has texted me uh, so you've got you got several more people that have bought it I know that as a scholar 
who has published in Eyes and Bronze, that you're making tons of money with every purchase. I know that. But, maybe a nickel or a dime, maybe. <laughs> but no, folks, you know, the, the big thing I think about uh, people like Dr. Durrell and, and other scholars like him is that we just want to get our our work out there, right? I say R, I feel like I put myself in that category. Maybe I shouldn't have, sorry. But, yeah. but no, I mean, you know, people, I love it when people download my dissertation, right? Um, and even though it's probably entirely too boring for most people, because who wants to read about syllabic uh, writings in Sumerian? But uh, it's that somebody else is reading it, somebody else is experiencing it. So please buy the book, um, you know, grapple with it. If you if you think you have a good response, let us know, um, and we'll uh, we'll entertain it. But that's I think that was a fantastic summary of that. So, um, what is the archaeological, iconographic, etc. evidence for child sacrifice in the Levant and the Mediterranean? I know you touched on it a little bit there. But mm -hmm. um, you have a whole chapter in the book on it. Maybe if you just want to summarize some points of it, that'd be awesome. Yeah. So um, it would be really, really nice if we had in the Hinnom Valley, which we know where it is. I mean, you can still you can go there today. Uh, um, uh, if we found the remains of the Tophet, which was the technical term, the Hebrew term for for this site. It's unclear what that meant, what the word meant, but that's the place you did these things. Um, uh, unfortunately, and not to get too morbid or graphic, uh, babies are mostly made of cartilage. They don't leave a lot behind. Unless you store it up in a jar like they did in Carthage, uh, there's probably not going to be anything left to excavate or not much of anything. Um, so we don't have any archaeological remains, um, but uh, we wouldn't expect to unless they intentionally preserve them for us. Uh, next best would be, for my thesis, would be if we found Phoenician sites, because that's not too far away, and I'm arguing that the Israelites borrowed the right from the Phoenicians. There have been a couple of suggestions. Um, I don't find any of them convincing, even though it would be really convenient for me if I did find them convincing. Uh, there's no solid evidence for a Tophet in Phoenicia. Um, again, a lot of that is because the nature of the excavations. If people still live somewhere, you can't excavate under their basements. They get upset. Um, this is Damascus. Damascus is one of the, I think, the oldest continually inhabited city in the world. It'd be wonderful if we could excavate it, but that'd be like excavating Manhattan. You, um, so, uh, so our best evidence remains from Carthage. And just to be completely honest, there are some that argue that even the remains at Carthage represent an infant cemetery, not a site for child sacrifice. And some of this is driven by the fact that um, in the last 40 years or so, people have become acutely aware of how societies describe one another. And the idea that just because the Roman authors, our classical fathers of Western civilization, said that the you know, uh, Carthaginians were doing this doesn't mean they actually were. And that's fair. Um, a lot of them were saying they were. And then we get this, these large fields full of urns containing both sheep bones and infant bones, which is interesting. And then on top of some of the urns are steal a tombstones thing that say this was a child sacrifice spot. Um, I mean, it's not quite that explicit, but it's pretty close. Um, so our, our good evidence comes from Carthage. Um, in that chapter of the book, I go through some other alleged evidence. All of it would be really, really helpful for me if it held up. Um, other than the Carthaginian material, I don't think it does. Um, there's some depictions of pharaohs like besieging, um, um, Canaanite cities and children being held over the walls and lowered down. Some have suggested those are child sacrifices. Maybe. I kind of doubt. Um, so yeah, the, the short answer is the evidence other than Carthage and the other and other colonies of the central Mediterranean. It's not um, Pharos and Mozia and um, uh, Caligari, Caligari. There's several all over Sicily and Corsica and North Africa. Um, there are these Tophet sites, and that's the good archaeological evidence. Um, hopefully, one day we find better evidence from 
Syria, Palestine itself. But um, yeah, the hard, the hard art. You know, I, I try to be honest in my assessment of the evidence and say, uh, here's what, here's my reconstruction based on the puzzle pieces we have. Um, hopefully, more puzzle pieces come to light. I mean, that's what archaeology, archaeology, and research is all about. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to kind of touch on something because um, we've said it, you've said it a couple of times uh, during the stream, and I think it's really important to um, to remember when you're when you're evaluating when you're evaluating texts, texts that do things, which is what mm -hmm. texts do. Um, you have to grapple with. We all have to grapple with. Um, are they are they being honest about what they're saying? Mm -hmm. uh, and this comes up a lot um, with respect to passages like, um, you know, Deuteronomy 20, 2010, I think, uh, 10 to 15, where it talks about the, the haram and uh, the ban that's supposed to be um, you know, put on the Canaanites. And if you, if you look at how the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hittites and Jebusites and blah, 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 um, are depicted, of course, they're the most vile, unimaginably wicked people mm -hmm. that... Uh, God put up with for 400 years, but then that's that's it. Um, I, I we got to wipe them out because they're just so unbelievably wicked. Um, and of course that's possible, right? That these people are just that horrific. Mm -hmm. Or um, perhaps it's it, it needs to be understood in uh, in its context of what are these texts doing. Mm -hmm. um, so how. You know, because we've talked about this, you just you just mentioned that uh, maybe in Carthage, that, that's just people saying things about them, and so you looked for something else. Like, is there something else to, to validate that? Um, so when you come up against texts um, like this, you know, do you find it to be? I know that I do. Uh, looking at Mesopotamian studies, when you talk about the Amuru or the Martu, you know, the mm -hmm. people that live in the mountains and eat raw meat, and they're just horrible, and you know. Uh, they have no understanding of anything. This is, you know, propagandistic literature, mm -hmm. I mean, text, you know, so they're, they're doing something. Do you find that to be something that you, um, do you think that that is something that happens in the Hebrew Bible with, with passages like, for example, um, these, these Canaanites are just so wicked that they have to be completely wiped off the earth because of how awful they are? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um... A lot of rhetoric in the Hebrew Bible. I mean, there, there are there are several rhetorical strategies, and one of the things I'm interested in is rhetorical strategies. Um, uh, there are a lot of rhetorical strategies for condemning something as wrong. Um, one of them is that it's foreign, um, and this is just um, cross-cultural, cross-historical. Even today, the, the, we don't we don't behave like foreigners do whether they're foreign uh, nationality, foreign race, if that's a concept that happens to exist in that society, foreign religion is a biggie. Um, we, we, we don't behave like the foreigners. Um, the, probably the most important book on child sacrifice written before mine and maybe still since mine uh, is uh, Stavrokopoulou, uh, Francesca Stavrokopoulou wrote a book specifically looking at the, the language surrounding foreignness in uh in the Hebrew Bible. And, and she's rightly skeptical of just because someone says it's foreign doesn't mean it's foreign. You can just call something foreign in order to, to demonize it. Um, I pulled back a little from that um, because I think there are a lot of ways you could go about saying something is wrong. Um, uh, I suggest that maybe one of the reasons that so much of the Hebrew, Hebrew Bible draws on this foreign rhetoric this anti-foreign rhetoric is because some of the elements that the schools, the groups responsible for at least chunks of the Hebrew Bible um, objected to, maybe some of the things actually did have foreign roots. Right? If Ahaz actually was imitating Phoenicians. Um, now, it's interesting to me that things that don't seem to have been foreign, then kind of almost like a snowball. This is child sacrifice, I think, at least the Molech offerings. Not all child sacrifice, which we might get to later. Um, child sacrifice, um, the Molech offerings were indeed foreign, I think, and or incorporated thoroughly into the Yahwistic cult. Um, 
But then all of a sudden things like uh, necromancy get called for, and soothsaying get called for, and uh, in the Holiness Code especially, all kinds of sexual depravity gets called for, and all of a sudden it becomes this rhetorical hook that you can just hang anything on that you object to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that you have to, again, case by case, critically evaluate, say, is there good evidence that this was actually for him? Um, I want to ask the question, why adopt that rhetorical strategy? Why start into the, why go after form? Why not say it's um, demonic? Why not say it's reprobate? Why not say it's just vile? Um, and I say, okay, well, maybe they, maybe child sacrifice was at least one of the small pebbles trickling down the hill that picked up, started picking up snow and caused the avalanche that so much of the Hebrew Bible depicts um, all illicit behavior as foreign. Um, and once it does that, once you've identified so many el religious elements you disagree with as foreign, it's not a large step to say that we not only need to exclude foreign practices, but the foreign peoples, even the legendary ones that, you know, what was a parasite? I, I, I don't know. Um, or a Hivite. Uh, <coughs> um, yeah, so I think people get tied to ideas. I think that can be dangerous, but I don't think it's necessarily um, incomprehensible. Awesome. Uh, you know, it's it's funny what in this in this vein, and then we'll move on to the the, the next section of your book. But you know, Lawson Younger um, uh, when he's at Trinity, I think he was at no, he maybe he wasn't at Trinity. Where was he? He taught at Trinity. Anyway, he wrote his dissertation on. Um, you know, comparing the conquest accounts in Joshua, I think nine to twelve, uh, up against like Sennacherib and other. I mean, he mm -hmm. looked at he looked at other um, conquest accounts in Egypt and what uh, Hittite. But um, you know, I think that I think that people. So, if for those of you that don't know about that, or if I haven't talked about it before, um, you know, is making the argument that there is rhetoric, as uh, Dr. Dura was talking about, that there's rhetoric with how. Um, people talk about their campaigns, right? So when it, there's this problem historically where you seem to have a nation that's completely wiped out in a passage, uh, men, women, children, everybody gone, dead, uh, cattle, you know, scorched earth sort of thing. And then, you know, in the next book, here they are again. And you, you what's going on here? You know, um, and there's there's rhetorical usage right and there, i don't think there's any question about that um it thus far in, in in my opinion um you might have a different view on that and that's totally obviously totally fine i'd love to hear um what you think about it but i don't think that that then can be brought you don't ever want to then broadly apply things uncritically right so then when you come to a passage like first samuel 15 which of course uh for those of you that watch us a lot you know that comes up on some of the other shows that I'm on for Samuel 15, where you know, Saul is told, go um, carry out the, the ban, right? Um, wipe out the, this, these Amalekites. And the story hinges specifically upon whether he does it or not. Um, and so then applying that rhetoric everywhere and saying, well, obviously Saul wasn't commanded to wipe out everybody. It was just supposed to be like really important people. You know that that's that sort of taking things uncritically, broad stroke to simplify things. I think is also dangerous. So I think when I hear Doctor uh, Durell, when I hear you talking about, um, I take a step back from that and I, I think about that. I, I think that's so important for everybody listening here. One of the things that we wrestle with um, in in academic circles is trying not to attach ourselves wholesale. You know, to one, to, to some person's point of view. And it's very difficult because that's the easy thing to do, particularly if they're your advisor or something. You know, you want to just grab onto what they say wholesale. And, and but they don't want you to do that. And that's the, that's the, the critical thing. Um, because we, we always want to be questioning what it is that we think. And that's, that's how we move forward. So, okay, I've waxed long enough about that. Um, what were the types of child sacrifice that were practiced in ancient Israel? Because you mentioned several of them, uh, and you, you've, you've alluded to it here. 
um, already in the stream uh, already. We've been going for an hour. Uh, I, I promise I won't keep you too terribly much longer. Uh, we'll, we'll, I've got one more question after this, and then I'll ask you to maybe summarize your argument in the book, um, and then we'll take some audience questions if that if that works for you. Okay, Great. so yeah, what, what, what were the types of child sacrifice that were practiced? Yeah. Um, so we talked a lot about the Molech, and that's the, the Molech sacrifice. And folks that know anything about child sacrifice in the Hebrew Bible, they probably at least know the word Molech, and they probably uh, think of a deity. But uh, another thing that I, the previous scholarship had tended to do was to conflate various forms of child sacrifice that I think were distinct. And I think they probably had different histories. Molech being one, have, I think having to do with vows. That, that is, you make a promise um, that, you know, if X, Y, and Z happens, if the gods, God or gods will do X, Y, and Z for me, then I will sacrifice my child. Um, that's, I think, the essence of a Molech sacrifice. And depending on where you are, probably dependent on which god or gods you made the promise to. Um, and again, I think that one was foreign, and I think it was imported sometime into the Jerusalem cult sometime during the reign of Ahaz. Would the, um, um, sorry to interrupt, would the Jephthah sacrifice have fallen into that category? Uh, so the Jephthah sacrifice, um, this is where you get into assessing different, um, uh, different texts in the Hebrew Bible in different ways. Um, there's a very, very common trope, um, uh, even in modern fairy tales, um, of this, uh, this idea that the unexpected happens and you're trapped in your own decision and you do something rash. Um, to me, Jephthah reads like a folk tale. That, that is, it, um, Jephthah, for those of you who don't know, Jephthah makes a vow. He's, he's out fighting uh, a battle and he says, if I win, I will uh, offer the first thing that comes out of my house to you, right? And then he comes home and, oh, no, my daughter is the first thing that comes out. And he's distraught. And his daughter says, no, no, you have to keep your promise. And then she asks for some time to go and mourn uh, with her friends before the act. And then apparently Jephthah carries it out. And that's the end of the story. Um, and people have written tons about what did Jephthah expect to come out of the house? Did he expect uh, a sheep? Because you did keep sheep on the ground floor of your house. Or, or maybe he was expecting a servant. And that would have been okay. And uh, I think it's a folk tale. I think it's a uh, it's it participates in the same thing. Uh, some some versions of Beauty and the Beast have a similar type thing. That the first person I encounter, oh no, it's my daughter. She's got to go back to the beast. Um, I don't. Maybe there's some history hiding in there, but I don't try to draw any out of it. Just like I don't try to talk about gingerbread houses in 17th century Germany because. You know, uh, because there's folk tales about that type of thing. Um, I think that was served. I think they served a different function. Um, I do think, though, that we have evidence for other kinds of child sacrifices that didn't involve vows. Um, I talked about the firstborn offering uh, in the Covenant Code. This is a chunk of Exodus, chunks pretty much right after the Ten Commandments, the famous, uh, the one in Exodus, not Deuteronomy. Um, this collection of law codes, or the collection of laws, I think a couple of codes probably stapled together. But um, And when it comes to the so-called law of the firstborn, which pretty much all the law codes of the Hebrew Bible have, it says, the firstborn of your cattle, uh, the firstborn of your sons you will give to me, so shall you also do with uh, your cattle and your flocks. Eight days it will be with its mother, or seven days it will be with its mother. On the eighth day you'll give it to him. No mention of sacrificing a sheep in its place. No mention of offerings of the temple. In fact, it says you'll also do the same with your cattle and your sheep, which presumably they would have been sacrificed, right? So Cain, Hebrews, so also. Um, and then the last chunk says seven days it will be with its mother. On the eighth day, you'll give it to me. In a world before Infamil and Similac, if you take a child away from its mother on the eighth day, it's not going to. So the sacrifice is the obvious interpretation of that or is the most straightforward, except for the fact that that would involve some groups believing that God wanted every firstborn child sacrificed uh, to God, um, to Yahweh, the God of Israel again. Um, 
what I try to do here in my book is to point out that it looks like we have lots of different Yahwistic groups represented. And it looks like that we have different groups who thought that you carried out the law of the firstborn, which they all seem to have shared, at least the ones represented in the Hebrew Bible, in different ways. Um, I suggest maybe these are the ultra pious, I hesitate to say ultra conservative, but they uh, just they said, well, the Lord says you're supposed to give your firstborn child. And if you're giving a sheep instead, well, that's not giving God your all, right? That that. So who knows how big this group was that lies behind this, this law collection? It could have been a small community. Um, uh, it could have been a lot. I don't know. We don't have... Uh, I do point out, though, that um, uh, in the ancient world, uh, infant mortality was off the charts, approaching 50%. Um, on top of that, infant mortality for firstborn children was even higher than that, uh, probably because if something's going to go wrong, um, when a woman is giving birth, it's going to be with the first one, not second, third, or fourth. Um, um, I also drew on some uh, modern anthropological studies that show that in societies with super high infant mortality rates, uh, parents don't tend to attach to their children in the same at the same early point that we do today. Um, I have an eight-year-old son myself. I have another son on the way in less than a month. Um, Congratulations. But, yeah, yeah. It's Sorry. Good time. Hey, that's, that's fantastic. That's amazing. Sorry. But, Go ahead. But, but so when we... So one, thanks to modern medicine, we assumed that we assumed that my son was going to make it, and um, and we started investing months before he was born, prenatal vitamins. We we decked out a nursery. I've recently built yet another crib. Uh, you might buy a you know I traded in my little uh, uh, coop for a sedan, right? You you start investing in children. For, um, in high infant mortality uh, societies, you can't afford to do that. Um, you uh, parents do attach to their children; and they love their children just as much as anywhere else. But that bonding tends to take place later. Uh, so I point out that, and if you really believe that by giving God the first chunk of your, the firstborn of your sheep, is going to cause the rest of your flock to be that much more fruitful. Or the first bushel of grain is going to make the rest of your harvest that much more bountiful. Um, if you really believe that that's how it works, then applying it to children makes sense because this is a very fraught and dangerous time, both for the child and for the woman. Um, you're probably going to have eight or 10 kids, probably four or five are gonna survive. Uh, but if you believe that offering up the first one who you don't attach to as quickly anyway, is going to cause the rest of your family to survive and thrive. Um, it makes sense logically. It makes sense uh, psychologically if you take into account the realities were very different than our own. At any rate, that's a different one. And that seems to have roots as far back as we, as far back, most folks think the covenant code is one of the oldest chunks of legal stuff in the Hebrew Bible. Not all, there, there's uh, conflicting views, but... Um, so that one seems to go way back, unlike, I think, the Molech sacrifice. Um, a third type of sacrifice that it's actually only explicitly described with regard to foreigners again, but that's uh, in uh, 2 Kings 3, there's an Israelite and Judahite campaign against Moab, the, the kingdom across the Jordan there. Um, it's not going well for Moab. Uh, the king of Moab, as he's pretty much walled in just to his capital, brings us firstborn, who was supposed to succeed him, on the wall of the city, sacrifices him, uh, this firstborn child, and then um, something called the, the, the Ketzep, the wrath, uh, goes against the Israelites and the Judahites and drives them off. Fascinating passage because one, it seems, one can assume that Mesha would have been sacrificing to the god of Moab, Chemosh, even though the Bible doesn't make that explicit. Um, Two, that it involves a child sacrifice. Three, that it seems to work. And the Bible never says, like, you know, oh, and it actually was a demon that did it. It was just like, no, of course that worked, is the, is the assumption. Uh, in Micah, 
there's a description of the people um, of Israel, uh, Judah actually, but Israel and Judah, um, who are calling on God. And they say, what can we give you that you'll listen to us? Should we give, um, uh, I'm going to forget the exact order, but uh, thousands of cattle and rivers of oil and these lavish offerings. And then the last one on the list is, should I give my firstborn for my transgression? Um, uh, the assumption seems to be that a firstborn child could be offered and accepted in times of great distress. Uh, interestingly, and I don't, I didn't find anyone, oh, bless you. Uh, the, uh, I didn't find anyone who had noticed this before. People tend to take those two firstborn sacrifices and treat them as evidence for one another. But if you sacrifice your firstborn on the eighth day, regardless, then you don't have a firstborn in times of distress. So to me, that points to diversity yet again. That one group of Yahweh seems to have thought that you were supposed to sacrifice every firstborn child to Yahweh. Others thought, no, 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 but if things get really bad, that might be an emergency sacrifice. But those couldn't have been the same group, right? Um, the Molech sacrifices, on the other hand, they mentioned sons and daughters and no mention of firstborn at all. So part of um, my book was trying to tease apart different child sacrifice rites described in the Hebrew Bible rather than lumping them all together. You know, they're, they're practically incompatible with one another as described. Um, and yeah, I think some, like the, the firstborn sacrifices, may have had very old roots in the Israelite cult. Others, like the Molech, could have had late roots. And so you have to trace the history of each. Uh, they do eventually get lumped together by the biblical authors themselves. That is, those who oppose the firstborn sacrifices, I think, intentionally lump them in together with the Molech sacrifices and say they're all bad. But early on, it looks like that they were distinct rites. Yeah. Excellent. It's uh, it's it's <laughs> so complicated, and uh, and there are so many things that um, yeah, I think I think that Jephthah story. I brought it up. I sorry, I didn't I didn't tell you I was going to bring that up. But I think it's something that probably a lot of people that are interested in this topic would like to to hear. So do you, um, I? I'm sorry. Uh, Megan texted me and said that Tim Smith gave us a super chat. Dr. Drew, I don't know if you know what that is, but uh, in the side chat, they can you can donate money. He donated ten dollars to us, which is amazing. Thank you so much, um, so that your your message gets highlighted. He didn't put a message in, uh, but he I think he was just saying that we love you. Maybe that's what it was. So uh, no, we really appreciate that, Tim. Thank you. But so the the Jephthah story. I mean, do do you think that as folktale or not, that the intention was that she was killed. Yes. Yeah. I, I think the assumption of the story is that, um, yeah, that it's, it's intending to describe that. I, my question would be, does that have been, does that reflect historical reality in any sense? It, just like, um, were, does, does a description of a witch living out in the woods, woods in a candy house, eating children, like, that's clearly what that story is describing. But the point of the story is not to describe reality. It's to tell an entertaining story that folks can imagine. So was, could, they, could yeah. they imagine it? Yes, they could imagine. So, like, was there a, you know, a semi-divine being uh, thrown down by the gods in the, uh, down by the water hole that uh, the prostitute went down and slept with for seven days and seven nights to turn him into a man. Does right. the story actually say that? Yes. Are right. we looking for historical reality there? No. So yeah, I think that's a, but, that's a, I think that's a fair point. But but you could, in theory, uh, draw conclusions about uh, the ancient institution of prostitution, even if you don't think they went out into the woods. Absolutely. The genre the genre requires. Um, and that, I think in that instance, that the people would know what prostitution was, that what prostitutes would do, and in order for that communication to make sense to them. So, yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Well, I have one more question, and then um, I'll ask you to, if you don't mind, just take a couple minutes and summarize. But I think if it hasn't been happening, uh, if you guys have questions for Dr. Durell, I'm sure that you do. Um, please put them in the side chat and tag uh, at Digital Hammurabi so that Megan can see them. And then she'll put them in a bunch of texts and text them to me. Um, and you've actually talked about this a little bit. Um, 
And actually, no, you have. The question was who practiced child sacrifice and who was against it. I think you've actually um, touched on that pretty well, unless there's something else you'd like to say about that. I, I would say that um, to me it's entirely unclear who, other than I think Ahaz and Manasseh, who was doing it, how many people were doing it, how prevalent it was. Was it a minority or majority? I don't know. Um, I wish I did. Hmm. Um, I would say that the biblical authors overwhelmingly um, were on the side that thought that this is not something that Yahweh desired, wanted. Um, interestingly, uh, and I won't go into too much detail, but um, they differed in the details of exactly why anyone would think that Yahweh wanted this. Um, uh, eventually it becomes, uh, and I think this is a late late development, but uh, they are equated with the, sh the Shadim, these demon spirits or whatever. Of course, that's that, they were always sacrificed to, to these foreign gods, deities, demons, whatever. Um, so there's different rhetoric uh, employed about uh, why people thought Yahweh wanted them, what, how much Yahweh participated in letting people think that that's what he wanted. Maybe Ezekiel says that God, Yahweh let the Israelites believe this um, to punish them. Israel rejected the laws that were good, so he gave them laws that were not good, and that led to them sacrificing their children. And it's not that Yahweh wanted child sacrifices, but he gave a law that indicated that or that could at least be interpreted that way in order to punish the Israelites for not following the good laws. Jeremiah actually outright says, I never gave them such a law, nor did, nor did it enter my mind. Um, which is interesting. That's, it seems to say the same thing, child sacrifice is bad, but it says it in two opposite ways. Like, um, uh, So yeah, I'm also very interested in the rhetoric used to combat child sacrifice within the biblical text, because just because you're opposed to child sacrifice, that doesn't exhaust the information we can draw about your assumptions, about the nature of a biblical law, the nature of Yahweh, Yahweh's interaction with Yahweh's people, and so on. Yeah. This is this has been fantastic. So, would you just take a couple minutes? Uh, you know, two, three, however long you want to take. Actually, uh, this is this is your time um, because I think people are really excited about what you're saying. Um, and just sort of, if if you had to give like a two or three minute elevator speech, not that you'd have two or three minutes in an elevator. I guess it'd have to be a really tall building. Um, but to just sort of summarize, I wrote my, and I'm sure you've done this 10,000 times now. Uh, if you could just summarize, here's what I wrote about. These are my basic arguments and this is my conclusion. Yeah. So, um, uh, I wrote about child sacrifice, uh, in ancient Israel. I argued that it was actually a part of ancient Israelite religion. Um, I stressed the fact that there are multiple types of ancient Israelite Yahwis who believed different things and practiced different things, even though they had strong commonality. Um, uh, I argue that there were three different types of child sacrifice, one involving vows, one involving uh, all firstborn children, or all firstborn, maybe just all firstborn sons, that's unclear, um, and one involving firstborn children who were sacrificed in times of great distress. Um, and then I uh, explored the rhetoric that biblical authors, um, including Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Deuteronomy, the holiness material, the different rhetorical strategies that they took, uh, the divergent and sometimes contradictory rhetorical strategies that, that they took, um, to argue that child sacrifice had no place in, in any cult of Yahweh. Um, that was the actual content of the project. What I hope that someone might be able to build on my work, assuming someone reads it and finds it fruitful, and um, there's a lot of thread to be pulled there, to, to, to trace rhetorical trajectories surrounding um, uh, Israelite religion. Israelite religion, like all religion, including ours today, changes over time. Um, that uh, And... Tracing those changes can reveal a lot about both the past, present, and where things are going. Um, I think chasing rhetorical tra trajectories through the Hebrew Bible reg regarding other topics um, is important work. And I think it's important for understanding Israelite religion to not treat it as a monolith that changed 
just as a monolith over time, but as a, a voices back and forth, arguing, agreeing, disagreeing, quibbling. Um, I think that's we see that with child sacrifice, and I think that if if you started pulling threads, you'd see it happening with other perhaps less morbid aspects of Israelite religion as well. I know that as, thank you, thank you. I think that's actually really helpful uh, kind of at the end of this to pull it all together. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Lewis is going to be coming out, it's got to be coming out soon, his book on Israelite right. religion. Um, any 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 uh, insider information on when that might be? I, at SBL, the Society of Biblical Literature meeting in November, he said it was, it was, Close. Uh, the, the, uh, I forget exactly how but I, I am. I am eager. whatever I am in the middle of that with the day that drops. Um, what I'm in the middle of will go onto the back burner until that book's done. Probably yeah. three days later. I imagine yeah. it. Um, the uh, I understand it's going to be long. Yes. Uh, he's been working on it for quite some time. Um, I think I he said it. something like a thousand pages when it, yeah. when I talked to him about it which yeah. is fantastic. I think everybody in the audience in particular is thinking the same sort of thing about my intro to uh, Ancient Sumerian, uh, the, the grammar that I'm writing. Um, and I think they're thinking when it comes out this summer, uh, it's just going to be the first thing that everything else goes by the wayside. Is, is this a teaching grammar or a reference grammar? Uh, it definitely be a teaching grammar, and it's designed for the layperson. Um, okay. So English is the only requirement, I think. Uh, for it, so it's written from a layperson's perspective, and um, yeah, the manuscript's done. We're actually Megan is drawing some of the hand copies now, um, and I'm gonna, I've got several sumerologists lined up to to do our own little peer review on it. But nice. uh, yeah, we're gonna I think we're gonna publish it. Digital Hammurabi Publications. This could be our first book. So um, very nice. Yeah, I think it'll be cool. Um, all right. Well, I am going to look at my texts, and I suspect there are going to be lots and lots of questions, and there are. So we will do as many as you feel comfortable doing. I promise I won't keep you uh, too terribly long, uh, but here we go. All right. So Lisa Irwin, did they sacrifice deformed, sick, retarded children or perfectly healthy ones to Molech uh, or as the Molech? Uh, we sacrifice all kinds on earth daily, then we throw them away. No, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the very short answer is uh, it doesn't say. Um, if I had to infer based on what we do have, uh, in, in the classical world, they abandoned children, which was, uh, and often especially uh, uh, children with various types of disabilities, um, Sometimes that disability disability might just be that they were a girl. Um, pretty much unanimously, if not unanimously, in the Hebrew Bible, um, it's explicit that you are only to sacrifice the good stuff. Um, the uh, I don't see any evidence in the Hebrew Bible of uh, sacrifice being used as a way to deal with unwanted children. Um, uh, Ezekiel 16 might be an example of just throwing an unwanted child out into the field. The assumption seems to be that you might walk by a field and see a screaming child that's been abandoned. Um, but yeah, I think if child sacrifice in ancient Israelite religion behaved according to any of what we know about Israelite religion uh, from other rites, I would expect that a healthy child would be the appropriate thing to be sacrificed uh, I wanted to say excellent. That would be to your answer, of course, not to, not to the the substance, uh, uh, the, the the topic. Um, so yeah, that's okay. Tim Smith, uh, did the Israelites take sh take child sacrifice from other Canaanite tribes? Um, so yeah, the the interesting thing about the word Canaanite um, is um, in the Iron Age. The only folks calling themselves Canaanite were Phoenicians. Um, that is, the, there was there was a shift in the way people lived from the Late Bronze Age to the Iron Age, um, and the Phoenicians kind of held on to the old city-state model. They held on to the more polytheistic, um, whereas the Israelites and the Judahites 
they seem to center their worship around one deity, whether there were other deities involved, uh, probably another show. Uh, uh, across the way, though, the Moabites, they seem to center their worship around the god Chemosh, um, a bit north of them. Um, the Ammonites, they seem to center their worship around Milcom. Um, so, yeah, when I say that the Israelites, at least with the Molech offerings, were bringing in Phoenician practice, um, yeah, that would have been Canaanite, not the only group of um, were they Did they, Deuteronomy and other places would, would depict them as getting it from the pre-Israelite inhabitants of the land and without getting into conquest or settlement models. Um, yeah, so yes and no. The, they would have, I think they were borrowing it from, Phoeni from Phoenicians, which were essentially Iron Age Canaanites. Um, uh, were these practices that the Israelites would have encountered when they came across the Jordan with Joshua? And so um, uh, that's a different question, about, and that would get into um, settlement models for ancient Israel with yeah. its own big can of worms. I find myself, when I'm in your situation on another show and people ask a question, I find myself at the end going, Oft, quite often, yes and no. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's uh, it's expected. I have a quick question of my own. Um, and I, I asked you this uh, in the um, in the uh, discussion just before we started, um, but because this came up actually very recently, and I just want another um, scholar's opinion on this. Someone that actually has their PhD in Hebrew Bible and teaches at Princeton. Um, would you say that, uh, one, would you say that the Hebrew Bible, uh, sorry, that the Torah, the Pentateuch, was written by Moses? And two, um, would you say that the, what person, obviously you can't say what percentage, but would you say that that is, whatever it is your position is, would you say that that is the majority position among what we might consider reputable scholarship and got reputable scholars or the minority position, if you feel comfortable answering that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I think that, uh, just, just to, 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 to stage my answer, I think that I probably am on the conservative end, end of the spectrum and that I think that Moses was probably a real person um, which again, that's pretty conservative amongst mainstream biblical scholarship. Do I believe that Moses was someone who led a group of Israelite slaves out of Egypt and brought the, probably not. Uh, but there does seem to be a tradition of tracing, um, one's priestly lineage back to Moses. Maybe there were competing Aaron and Moses schools. Um, there are a lot of problems with the idea that Moses even could have written the Pentateuch, uh, not the least of which, uh, Moses as presented in the Hebrew Bible, um, would have been living sometime in the Bronze Age. Uh, Hebrew wasn't a language yet. That is the Hebrew of the Hebrew Bible. So it's, if, Mo if Moses wrote it, then it would have had to, at the very least, have been translated from Bronze Age Canaanite, maybe, into Iron Age Hebrew. Um, uh, it's also worth noting that the Hebrew Bible never says that Moses wrote it. Um, it says he wrote down some of the laws. Um, uh, so, no, I, I, I think that uh, the evidence is pretty strong that we have at least three to five, depending on how you count them, different law codes that are kind of woven together. Um, I think that's the easiest explanation for why God tells Moses, okay, go tell the Israelites this thing that you already told them twice and this time. Um, there's some differences in the details and they can figure out how to harmonize it all later when the rabbis come along. Um, uh, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't mean that someone necessarily sat down in the Persian period and just started writing the whole thing from scratch either, um, which is another end of the spectrum, which I think would be good. Um, yeah, I think these things grew up over time. I think that they were clearly, um, important stories for Israelite identity. For me, uh, this is a bit of a rabbit trail, but um, I think it's important not just to ask, did this actually happen? Um, but also to ask, why was it important for the ancient Israelites 
to understand their history in this way. Um, why were these stories important? Um, I mean, even if you think about uh, American history today, for different people, the way in which we tell our American story, for American viewers out there, um, is contentious. Even when we don't disagree about the facts that happened, um, I mean, I'm still old enough to remember, maybe in some circles it still is controversial, uh, that Black History Month was a controversial thing when I was a kid. Um, but the, the reason it was controversial was because it's saying, no, this Af the African-American history is American history. It is part of the fabric and, and that there are stories out there that aren't just the pilgrims and Plymouth Rock and Columbus that other folks' stories make up. Um, so asking why people think that certain aspects of their remembered history are important tells you a lot about the, the people that you're trying to understand. Um, and again, I, for me, the ancient Israelites, for all their, their flaws and virtues, I, I do. I view them as my religious forefathers, and I want to understand them. I want to understand um, their encounter, uh, how, they, how they perceive their encounter with God, because it does— um, it's kind of the prehistory of my own. Sorry for the rabbit trail. No, that was uh, an amazing answer. And I think it, it highlights two things. Number one, um, that it's not necessary for uh, faith, uh, Christian faith, um, for, for scholarship, for people in, for people in scholarship uh, to somehow... I don't know, fight against the evidence, right? And I think what you've just heard Dr. Durell say, and uh, please correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong in this, but that, uh, you know, even though uh, mainstream scholarship would say, uh, you know, no, Moses couldn't have written the, the, the Torah and that there are several um, streams of tradition and, and authors uh, or codes that were put together um, in, a, in, in a fairly elaborate way, um, and that even so, he's on the, the conservative end of that, uh, thinking that there actually was a Moses, right? And, uh, you know, I guess, I guess what I'm saying is to all the, the fundamentalist evangelical Christians out there listening, like I was, uh, like Dr. Durell was, the, the, there's another way that you can, you can understand these texts in a, in a much, I don't mean this in a degrading way, but a much more sophisticated fashion where you're actually engaging honestly with the evidence and it doesn't kill your faith. And uh, I just think that's really important to say. So thank you for sort of being vulnerable with us there. I, I really appreciate that. Um, and I'm sorry that I hijacked a question. There are so many here. Okay. Uh, Steffi Calligraphy. Hey, Steffi. Um, but if Molech was a sacrifice to Yahweh, why then does Yahweh speak against it so? Good. Um, uh, in uh, the Holiness Code, that is the uh, large chunks of Leviticus, um, it's uh, it. Uh, I'm forgetting the exact language, so uh, forgive me if you look it up. And but it, the sacrifice to Molech offerings is said to uh, defile the Lord Yahweh's name. Um, that is, the Hebrew Bible is not just concerned with which deity you worship. It, large chunks of it are also very concerned that you worship Yahweh the right way. Um, the uh, and uh, for the traditions preserved in the Hebrew Bible that are concerned with the Molech offerings, uh, the concern seems to be that by worshiping Yahweh in the wrong way, um, Yahweh doesn't want to be worshipped in the wrong way. Yahweh wants to be worshipped in the right way, and that. The certain types of sacrifices or carrying out certain sacrifices in certain types of way can actually be blasphemous. Can I mean, the sacred is dangerous and the sacred is to be protected um, because um, I mean, the story of Aaron's son that bring the strange fire in and then they're consumed. Um, that there was a definite conception that you needed to worship Yahweh in the correct way, carry out the right rituals. In the modern world, it's uh, many religious movements kind of askew ritual. As, as belief is what's important. What do you believe? What do you believe? Um, for them, it was very important that you did the right things, especially surrounding the cult uh, of Yahweh. Um, 
so yeah, this is this is the biblical rhetoric is why you shouldn't do them because Yahweh doesn't want them, and if you do them in Yahweh's name, um, um, it's sacrilegious. Um, Excellent. Um, Tim Smith, was cannibalism used in times of famine in the Near East? Uh, in the Bible, in the Epic of Atrahasis, there seems to be a degree of cannibalism. Uh, yeah, in, in the Bible during sieges, um, uh, one of the stories um, the, in the Hebrew Bible describes a siege in which two mothers agreed to eat their sons on subsequent days. They ate the first child, and then the second child uh, the mother hid the child away. Um, and uh, the moral of the story being eat the other kid first. I don't uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, but no, but it's, well, there goes our monetization. Uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, unlike child sacrifice, there's no indication that I know of. I, mean, I, I haven't read every ancient Near Eastern text, but, um, no indication that I know of that, um, anyone thought of this as something good. Yeah. But a child sacrifice was, at least from one perspective, and one group of people's perspective, something that was the gods desired and that was a virtue to carry out. Uh, cannibalism is universally depicted as something that you're driven to, that it's horrific. Um, descriptions of cannibalism in the Hebrew Bible are uh, under the worst circumstances, famines and sieges, that it's, it's used as, as an illustration of the worst thing you can imagine, mothers eating their own children. Um, so unlike in some other civilizations and societies, no indication of ritual cannibalism, um, of which I'm aware, um, okay. the same way as child sacrifice. Okay, let's see. We have a lot of a lot of questions. I think we can get through most of them. Um, so biblical history skeptics, uh, in case it isn't covered, uh, Okay, he did talk about this, uh, but was true skeptics. His opinions about the god Moloch and passing through the flame. Uh, sorry, I think all these questions got saved up throughout the stream, so we might have covered some. That's fine. Um, so, Steffi Calligraphy, do some sects of modern Jews still perform child sacrifice as some YouTube videos have purported? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah, no, is what I would say. Um, uh, skeptical Christian. Uh, I really hope that Dr. Durell will address the strange text in Ezekiel 20, 25 to 26. Do you know that off the top of your head? This is the laws that are not good. Um, the, uh... Sorry, I feel like, I feel like uh, these questions oh. might ambush you. It's really tough to everybody out there while he's looking this up. It's really tough being live, being the one that's sort of in the spotlight and having people ask you questions about your the thing that you studied because there's always an aspect uh there's always something that um you know it, it escapes your mind or uh, something that maybe you didn't focus on but because it falls in that vein everybody thinks you must know it uh no, no, immediately it, it, it is it's the laws that are not good um there are a couple of ezekiel texts and i just would it's been a year since it, so yeah and also i gave to them uh, statutes uh, not good, lotobim, uh, and and ordinances by which uh, people cannot live, and I defiled them in their giving uh, to pass over every firstborn of the womb, uh, so that uh, I might desolate them, uh, so that they may know that I am the Lord. Yeah, this is the passage I was talking about yeah. earlier, that uh, Ezekiel presents Israel's history in this chapter, pretty much from the beginning, as one of just repeated. Um, disobedience, uh, which is slightly different than the depiction elsewhere. Sometimes there's a golden age. Hosea, for example, has this golden age in the wilderness when Yahweh and Israel got along, and now they've fallen apart, and now we go back to the wilderness to fix it. Ezekiel, it's been bad since square one. Um, and yeah, 25, 26, the, the presentation is that uh, Yahweh got fed up enough that, he, fine, they're not going to follow good laws, I'll give them some bad ones. And these bad laws result in them sacrificing their children. Um, note that Ezekiel still thinks child sacrifice is bad. I think Ezekiel's trying to work with the fact that the covenant code, which Ezekiel seems to think is in some way authoritative, I wouldn't say canonical, but you know, it holds some, uh, trying to both say that, yeah, that's a real Yahwistic 
collection of rules. Laws is probably not the right word. And no child sacrifice is completely unacceptable. Yeah. Um, it's like Jesus and divorce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that you're. I mean, Jesus never wanted to say in the Sermon on the Mount that Moses is wrong, but you know we're gonna we're gonna work with yeah. both affirm the authority of the of the tradition and to argue for a new interpretation of that tradition, which is a really fascinating rhetorical move. Yeah, watching biblical authors work with traditions that are preserved elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible, um, you get to see exegesis on the ground running right there in the text itself. Yeah. Uh, Paula Gia asks, uh, please ask Dr. Durow what books he recommends on the formation of the Pentateuch. Who? Uh, <laughs> uh, I think if I had read nothing on it before, um, I would probably read um, Joel Baden's book, knowing that that comes from a documentary perspective, his, his more recent one on the Pentateuch. He's got, Joel writes a lot. Um, but, uh, it's a, um, and then I would probably read uh, uh, David Carr's uh, book on the formation of the Hebrew Bible, who comes from the exact opposite perspective. Um, I would try to read both with a critical and skeptical eye, which is what I do, um, trying to find the strengths and weaknesses of both perspectives, because it, uh, the composition of the Pentateuch is, thank goodness I don't really work on the Pentateuch. Hmm. That's not my day job. I um, uh, but yeah, there there are currently two different views, neither of which has anything to do with mosaic authorship. Two very different views for how the Pentateuch came together, um, and there's very little common ground even in the foundations. So I read two different books, two different perspectives. Uh, Baden and Carr are nice for, for an English reading person uh, place to start. And for those of you that haven't seen the stream with Dr. William Reed that we had a couple of months ago, he uh, he came on and talked about the Deuteronomistic history, and so mm -hmm. we we touched on uh, you know some of this stuff uh, more generally. So yeah, take a look at the stream there as well. Uh, of course, you know Dr. Reed. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah he's uh, I I love everybody that comes out of Hopkins, frankly. So. <laughs> Um, Chris Baker asks, Dr. Durrell, in your research, have you found um, a document, uh, have you found and document that are outside Genesis 1 to 3 that gives more information on the revelation Moses received? Have you found, do you understand that? Hmm, it's probably I just would, a typo. But. Yeah, no, um, so, uh, it's a, I would say that we do have, uh, these are mostly late Hellenistic type, um, retellings of these stories that kind of fill out the details, um, and even later into the Roman period. Uh, uh, this is again where uh, the Jewish tradition, um, they're much more comfortable uh, preserving almost uh, the fan fiction uh, of, uh, so, there, there's a, what they call Targum, which are Aramaic translations of the Hebrew Bible. Some of them, like the Targum Ankalos, uh, which is one of the Targums, it stays pretty close. Uh, but then uh, others, like uh, it's commonly called Targum Pseudo-Jonathan, um, uh, the Cain and Abel story is one of my favorites. Um, the Cain and Abel story in the Bible is really short. It's not clear how Cain kills Abel, why. It just says he got, you know. Targum Suter Jonathan, they have a debate about the righteousness of God. And they go back and forth and Cain uh, about whether God is just for, for rejecting one sacrifice and not another. Um, so we do get these expansions in the tradition. Um, I hope that addresses some of the questions. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so... Uh, Apikoro 613 asks, In 2 Samuel 21, David kills seven of Saul's grandsons to appease God, who has caused a famine over a betrayal of an oath to the Gibeonites. It takes place during the barley harvest, Pesach. Any thoughts? Sounds to me like a sacrifice. Oh, yeah. I would... I would. So, 
I intentionally restricted my research to parents sacrificing their own children. Um, there's uh, another scholar, uh, Jason Tatlock is his name, T-A-T-L-O-C-K, I'm pretty sure, um, who explored a broader swath, and he points to exactly this sort of thing, where humans are sacrificed. Um, uh, I would simply refer you to his work. I believe his book should be, his book should be coming out shortly. He's written a handful of articles um, uh, on exactly this topic. And yeah, so I, I do not pretend to have exhausted the topic of what one may consider human sacrifice uh, in my study of child sacrifice, which is really only a study of the sacrifice of one's own children. Um, what, For example, we talked about the uh, harem before. Uh, is that a human sacrifice? If God tells you to go out and kill every man, woman, and child in battle, whether they were doing it or not, would that constitute this holy war? Is that sacrifice? And yeah. that gets into the issue of what makes a sacrifice a sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Jason Tadlock would say yes. Excellent. Um, okay, I think I th we've got... It's 347. Uh, I really don't want to uh, push you too much here. I, if we can get through a couple more, but if, if you reach your, your limit, just tell me. Um, Beach Price, what time period did this stop? Um, as far as I can tell, um, we don't have any good, firm evidence um, uh, for... I don't think any of the types of child sacrifice, not really good evidence, uh, after Josiah's reform. Um, that is, uh, Josiah, the best of the Judahite kings, according to the uh, Samuel kings, the Deuteronomistic history. Um, it looks, at least as presented in the Hebrew Bible, once that reform is carried out, there's no mention of, uh, there's no accusation that people uh, are doing. It gets complicated because... Um, Jeremiah and Ezekiel are still talking about it. It's unclear to me if they're talking about it as something still going on or as something that the ancestors of the people living during that time had done, because both are very concerned with ancestral sin that is getting punished for. Um, maybe Ezekiel seems to still be saying that some folks were sacrificing their firstborn children. Um, but yeah, it's it's... No, definitely by the time the exile's over, I, I don't know of any indication that child sacrifice was still part of any aspect of Israelite or that maybe at that period you'd call it Jewish, um, early Jewish, Persian period Judaism uh, practice. Gotcha. Uh, Trevor Lund, is there any non-Hebrew text where their foes use hyperbole to the effect of, quote, we are prepared to sacrifice our own children in our fight against your false god Yahweh, end quote? Hmm. Nothing off the top of my head exactly in that vein. Um, I would say this isn't what you asked, but something springs to mind is... Um, That's a very Professor know, McCarter response there, by the way. This isn't what you asked. But. <laughs> no, I would say that uh, in the so-called Mesha Stila, there's the description of a cherem that sounds a lot like what the Hebrew Bible is describing. Hmm. Um, but yeah, not that I can think of. Okay. Um, Shrish Zen asks, does the Bible reference child sacrifice that they do, for example, the Jephthah story, um, as something that's not necessarily killing? I've heard an explanation that says he basically gave her up to the ruler. I think we talked about that earlier. And there is a, you know, obviously tradition or a thought in, in, in scholarship. So I'm, some, yep. well, I'll let you answer it. Sorry. Yeah, no, there are um, um, there are different ways of giving a child um, preserved in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, one of the common one is the Samuel story. Right? Hannah asks for a child. Mm -hmm. uh, Samuel's mother uh, promises that if she gets the child, she'll give Samuel back to God. Right. Um, the uh, and there, the way that Samuel gets given back is when Samuel's old enough to be weaned, um, doesn't need to be fed by his mother anymore. He's literally given to the temple as a temple servant, more or less. Um, uh, and there are other ways that firstborn children could be given to, to Yahweh. My work was mainly showing that at least the one 
Exodus 22, 23. That doesn't work. It says on the eighth day, hmm. you have to give the child. Um, and that's why the reason Sam, Hannah waited until Samuel was old enough is because that's early as she could give him and he'd survive. Yep. Uh, that seems to be talking about an actual sacrifice. Uh, but yes, there are certainly other ways to give someone um, uh, to Yahweh. Um, and uh, this gets played out in different ways. Some have pointed and suggested that um, uh, the Jewish rite of circumcision well, it may be one of these other types of reinterpretations of what may go way, way back, at least among some folks, um, uh, to this sort of thing. But, uh, yeah, so there, yeah, there are plenty of ways that people could be given or, or to be dedicated or however, uh, and they're in the Hebrew Bible. Um, but to me, it looks like at least some of the ways involve actual sacrifice. Excellent. Uh, so Andy L H, uh, which there are three more questions. Uh, which and and I, folks, uh, I think we're gonna have to stop after three more because I, I he, he he's got to go live his life. So, <laughs> um, which other belief systems in the Middle or Near East practice child sacrifice contemporaneous with Yahweh? Oh yeah, um, my to my knowledge, and I looked hard. The only good evidence is um, the Punic colonists of the central Mediterranean. And if you think they brought it with them from Phoenicia, as I do, then you would posit that the Phoenicians were as well. It was not a widespread thing during this period uh, in, uh, in other civilizations, so far as we can tell. Pedro uh, Hoffermann, was it mentioned during the stream if there is a possibility for the part where Abraham doesn't have to sacrifice Isaac, after all, was added later to the text? Oh, yeah. So this is... Uh, now that folks have already ordered the book, I guess I this is probably the most disappointing part is that I relegate Abraham to a footnote because that passage is a mess. Um, for exactly this. Um, some have suggested that the verbs for what happened going up the hill are plural. The ones going down the hill are singular. Like they went up, they did this, they did that. He came down, he did it. Um, that may preserve an older version of the story in which Isaac was actually sacrificed. Um, Maybe not. There, the, the, the angelic or divine intervention, there seems to be a couple of layers, like a couple of voices come down. It's a very complicated story. Um, and you can only state, write one dissertation. So Yeah, well, and, and one could easily argue that if you're going to write a dissertation on child sacrifice, you ought to mention Abraham Isaac more than a footnote. Uh, but yeah, it's a very complicated story. And some have suggested that either... This originally ref reflected a, a practice of child sacrifice, or that others have suggested that this uh, this represents a justification for why we don't sacrifice our children anymore. Old Father Abraham, he took Isaac up. God provided a ram. This is why we now sacrifice rams instead of children. Yep. Uh, maybe, but the story is just yeah more complicated than I'm willing to pick apart. Understood. Uh, okay. Uh, right. So. Uh, Giriga, Giriga. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong. The book of uh, Jasher has more details. Why is this doctor not mentioning this? Uh, the as as in the the, the book that's cited in the. Um, I'm not, I would. I'm not sure. Uh, rather than make more of a fool of myself, I'll just say I'm not I'm not exactly sure what's uh, what they're referring to. There. So, Grierga, uh, shoot us an email, digitalhammurabi at gmail.com, and um, and I can pass it on after the stream if, for, with more details, if that works for you. That's um, great. Not that you're going to be held to answering that question after the stream. This is it. We can't give you homework. Uh, well, <laughs> I need you to come back at some point. <laughs> All right, one more. Uh, Tim Smith, um, where do you think Oh, you just talked about this. Where do you think the sacrifice of Isaac story comes from? It's, yeah. It's, uh, it's messy. Yeah, well, it's a mess. It I, uh, this has been fantastic. And, uh, you know, Megan normally does the interviews because she's British and she has that uh, wonderful voice and she's so much more pretty than I am. Uh, but I really wanted to, to interview you because I, I'm just, well, obviously we have history and uh i just i really think i really uh well 
I just think you're a very impressive scholar, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come on here. Um, and again, the the book link, the, the link to the book, I think is in the description. If it's not, it's been in the chat, uh, but I, it will be in the description. So please uh, buy the book. I think it's well worth uh, the read. I've got it here somewhere. Oh, I, she took it so it wouldn't clutter up the uh, area here. But it's uh, I just read it. Um, it's just uh, it's just fantastic work. So, but thank you, Doctor Durell, for coming on, and um, I'll uh, I'll just I'll end it here. And thank all of you for watching. Uh, it's been a fantastic time. Thank you for all the questions. Oh my gosh, zero one three two one three two just gave us a super chat for two uh, twenty three dollars and thirty two cents. Thank you so much. And it says Merry Christmas. Uh, Merry Christmas. Enjoy talking about child sacrifice and the like. So thank you very, very much for that. If you haven't liked the stream, um, please do so. That always helps us. If you haven't subscribed, obviously we'd love you to do that. And um, yeah, again, check out the book. All right, well, uh, until next time, resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how do you know that? Thanks, guys.